And as, as Benny mentioned, uh, I love questions. I love stories. I love tangents. So feel free to stop me, interrupt me, come off mute, put it in the chat. Somebody can, can interrupt me. Uh, thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, it is 1 o'clock in the afternoon, my time, or 1.30, I guess. So I, I have not yet had a chance to have an evening beverage, but I will be doing so later. Uh, and today we're going to talk about disaster recovery techniques for Azure SQL Database and managed instance. Uh, I am John Morehouse. I am a principal consultant with Denny Chair and Associates. Let's see if my clicker works. Of course, my clicker is not going to work now. There it goes. Uh, my contact information is on the slide before you. Uh, I always say this. Uh, you can email me at john at dcac.com. Whether it's a question about the presentation, you got a question about SQL Server or whatever. We are at Denny Chair and Associates. We're pretty community focused. We like helping out. If we know the answer, we'll be happy to help you. If we don't know the answer, we probably know somebody who does and we can point you in the right direction. I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect me at LinkedIn. Twitter is the only social media platform I am on. I'm not on, uh, I take that back. I do have an Instagram account. I don't know how to use it. So Twitter is the only thing I'm on. Uh, that's SQL R Us, not SQL Russ. So if you think about Toys R Us here in the United States, it's like that. Everything in SQL, that's pretty much what I do. I touch just about every facet of SQL Server in some capacity. Just don't ask me to write Power BI reports because that's not my wheelhouse. Uh, I used to blog pretty regularly at SQLRS.com. The pandemic kind of slowed that down, I'm trying to pick that back up. I will say that I blog usually about the internals of SQL Server, doing a lot more Azure level work now so uh, but i'm that crazy dba that likes to spend my saturday nights reverse engineering hexadecimal because i don't have a social life um, highly active in the community uh, i'm honored to be a microsoft mvp data platform for the redgate vmware v expert a quick blurb about denny charity associates if you don't know who we are we are a small shop there's only about eight of us here um, but we focus on helping companies do better with sql server and making their things run faster uh, I say this, I've been using my presentations to promote vaccines, wear a mask, get boosted, stay safe. I lost my dad to COVID in August of last year, so please get vaccinated, get boosted, stay safe. Uh, what we're going to kind of cover today are backups, geo-replication, failover groups. We'll go, I got a number of demos that we can kind of go through, and of course, if there's any questions and answers. Now, when we go to Azure, um, we I still have conversations with individuals that when we talk about the cloud, they think it's this nebulous construct where the data is kind of just floating out in the ether. And yeah, it's 2022, but we still have these conversations. And I still have clients today that want to go to a cloud platform. I'm going to focus today on Azure, but really this this logic applies to regardless of what cloud platform you might move to, whether it's AWS or Google or Azure, there are, we have to take disaster recovery into account because things happen such as, and we typically call this a rabid backhoe or um, a backhoe phenomenon where there's a construction worker that's on a piece of heavy equipment like a backhoe here, and they accidentally dig into the wrong line. And that wrong line is the power to the entire data center, or it is the internet connectivity line. It's something that is keeping that data center online where your data happens to be sitting. Uh, true story, I worked in an organization in Omaha, Nebraska. We were doing construction around the building, and this exactly happened. They, An operator on a backhoe actually cut the entire power line to the building. Uh, you can actually watch the power arc off the machine. I'm kind of dangerous for the construction worker, but it obviously took down the entire the entire facility. Um, thankfully, we had a UPS, and you know things got uh, back up and whatnot. But that actually does happen, and it, and it happens to cloud providers. Or if it's not a physical disaster, the service fabric in Azure is programming. And that is programmed mostly by humans. And so humans make errors as well. Um, not too long ago, we had a DNS issue with Azure. Um, we had an issue with Azure Active Directory a few months back where things couldn't authenticate. That happens. How do we plan for that? So we have to think about how are we going to recover from disasters, even if we go into the cloud. Just like we have on premises, the cloud offers some new challenges, but it also makes things better. So 
when we go to a cloud platform, we still have to figure out what those challenges are and then find the answer and then find a solution. If you're not doing disaster recovery in the cloud, you really should be. So here are some DR questions that I like to ask, and I like to ask these questions regardless of where I'm at. Do we know how to recover the data? If you're on premises, how do you do that? Where is that data sitting? Do you have the scripts in place? Do you have the runbooks in place to recover that data? Now, when we talk about platform as a service, and that's what we'll focus on today is Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed Instance, we're limited to what we can do with those with the data and how we recover it. So our recovery process is going to be different in the cloud than it will be on premises. This is a big one. Do we know how long it'll take to recover? With the nature of platform as a service, your recovery time will vary. And that is just the nature of the beast of the cloud platform. But do you know what those timings are going to be? Especially when your CEO, CIO, CFO, C-level folk is sitting behind you because you know they are, right? And they're whispering in your ear, how long is this going to take? We're, de we're losing money. How long is it going to take? We as data professionals should be able to say, hey, on average, this recovery takes X number of minutes, X number of hours, whatever that might be. Does your disaster recovery solution in the cloud meet your RPO and RTO requirements? So RPO is recovery point objective and RTO is recovery time objective, meaning how much data can you lose and how long can you be down? Because the cloud offers up different aspects of disaster recovery, those RPO and RTO values could be different than what you have on premises. Are you asking that question of, okay, it's a different environment. We should be asking about the cloud side of things. Does that solution meet our RPO and RTO requirements? And for those requirements, I, as a data professional, I like to go above and beyond. For example, I've got a client that they have an RPO and RTO of 24 hours. So they can be down for 24 hours and they can lose 24 hours with the data. I don't like that. And so their RPO and RTO right now is 15 minutes because that's what I've, I've architected out for their solution is I've gone above and beyond their RPO and RTO requirements. Thing I get a lot, when we talk about Azure uh, disaster recovery in just in general is that high availability gives me a level of DR and that's not really the case. High availability is usually within the same data center. If we think about the cloud platform in Azure and all the, all the cloud providers, they're all broken up into various regions, right? So there's an East region in the United States, there's a West region, there's UK regions, there's South Africa regions, Australia regions. These regions can have individual issues. Uh, a good example would be in the United States on the East Coast, we deal with hurricanes. Hurricanes will come up from Florida and come up the Eastern seaboard. And there are at least two very large region data centers of Azure in Virginia. Those hurricanes can cause issues. If we have high availability within that same region, that hurricane could take out the entire region. Is that really possible? Yeah. Is it likely? Probably not, but high availability is usually within that same region. You can use high availability to include a DR methodology. And the example I use of this is if you're familiar with uh, SQL servers always on availability groups, I can have high availability within the same data center, but then also have a asynchronous node somewhere else. I'm going to put that third node somewhere else outside of my primary region so that if that hurricane does happen, I can fail over to that region. I'm going to put, and I'm going to use the United States as an example, I'm going to put that third node and say, Chicago, Illinois area, the central region of the United States, or I could go all the way across to the Western seaboard. If a hurricane affects both the Eastern seaboard and the Western seaboard at the same time, I got bigger problems than where my, my disaster recovery node is sitting. And I like to say a DR radius of greater than hundred miles. If you have an on-premises data center and your DR center is 10 blocks down the road, you're doing DR wrong. 
Uh, I know several clients that that's actually the way that it is. Um, I've got a friend here in the uh, Louisville, Kentucky area where their data center, you can see from the office building, it's too close. Um, because if a tornado happens, hurricane happens, whatever, you've now put all your eggs into one basket. So I tend to like my DR solution to be at least 100 miles or in the cloud cloud world in a completely different region uh, than what my primary region is. Asynchronous versus uh, synchronous. Again, if I go back to like the availability group type of mentality, uh, HA is going to be usually synchronous. So that I have, um, and they're local located. So I've got quicker commits between the two. Whereas my DR center is going to be asynchronous because I can't beat the speed of light. I have to include latency from point A to point B, especially if that's going on all the way across the United States or halfway around the world, wherever that might be going. So DR is usually asynchronous, whereas high availability is going to be synchronous uh, in terms of nature. Neither of these will necessarily fix your performance issues. I've actually had uh, clients that expect that high availability and or DR will magically fix their performance issues. And neither of these are about fixing performance issues. This is about ensuring business continuity for when things go sideways. And it's not a matter of if they'll go sideways, it's a matter of when. Something will happen and something that probably unexpected will go sideways and we have to have that disaster recovery plan in place. So with that, I think I saw a couple of questions pop up. Yeah, one question there. Um, sure. With regards to the, the 15 minute RTO RPO versus the 24 hours, how much more uh, expensive, let's say both in, in uh, time and funds, was that ballpark probably just? So in this in the in that instance, the the cost was relatively minimal um, because they a couple of different things that we did to ensure disaster recovery for them. They have it's, they are primarily on premises, but they originally were okay with doing like transaction log backups every hour, every two hours, whatever. And I said no, let's let's move that to every fifteen minutes. But the other thing we did was they were backing up to a local network attached storage, which is very common, right? So many organizations will just back up to a local um, a data center, data store, if you will. And so at that point, we actually said, hey, let's actually move that to Azure cool blob storage where we could reduce, they pay for the storage, but with that cool pricing tier, it's relatively uh, inexpensive. And they have a data retention policy of 30 days. They, for auditing purposes, they have to keep at least 30 days of backups for retention. And that actually fits the cool storage because the cool storage, if you delete before that 30 days, you get charged extra. So I actually have a, a PowerShell script that basically moves all their backups on a daily basis to Azure Blob Storage. So in that case, the cost and time was Eh, it took me a couple hours to figure out the PowerShell and get all that kind of squared away and whatnot. So in that case, it was relatively minimal to get them above and beyond their 24-hour RPO and RTO. And that's a good question, though, because that, that could affect your cost, right? So if you need, if they had needed, let me rephrase this, they were okay with that cool storage, pulling that, if they had an outage or they needed a file, pulling that data out, uh, was thankfully in the, it's, it's just a, the exact same tier as the hot tier. But if they was like in the archive tier, they were okay with that time that it would take to get that file back. If you know we needed instantaneous re, you know retention or instantaneous restore or anything like that, that's going to cost money. So that's a good question, for sure. And my clicker's not going to work now. Yay! So. We need DR for our cloud solution. You know, we're in Azure and we've got an Azure SQL database or a managed instance. How do we do DR? And I kind of equate this to donuts because I like donuts. And it's always, which donut do you choose? I, of course, want all the donuts, but I like the ones with sprinkles. That's just my preference. That's what I like. So how do we choose what method works best from a DR perspective? And there's a number of methods that we can do depending on what product we are using, and each one has pros and cons, and we're going to kind of step through these. So let's talk about some methods. 
we can manually back things up, DR things, right? I don't like that method. We'll talk into that. But we can restore from backups. We can use active geo replication with Azure SQL database, or we can use automatic failover groups. Um, they all, all these methods have various pros and cons. Obviously, the manual all the way to the, the manual is the most painful. The auto failover groups is the least painful. And keep in mind that I am a lazy DBA. So by the end of today, you'll probably easily figure out that I really like automatic failover groups. But let's talk about manual. So we're, we're going to walk all through these. In an Azure SQL database, you can export it. You can go into the portal, and I'll show you when we get to the, de the demo section. You can actually go into the portal, go to the database, and there's an export button. This is very comparable to if you've ever done a DAC pack or a backpack out of um, SQL Server Management Studio. It actually generates that DAC pack. Excuse me, I think that's a backpack with the data. My experience, the export process, if you have a larger database, an Azure SQL database, the exporting of the database has some issues and may not actually work. And you have to export the database in the middle of a disaster. It may or may not be online. I don't know. I don't like the export of the database, and I rarely use it because it is painful, in my opinion. It is painful to export that database, download that, DAC, that backpack, and then do something with it. It also requires somebody to have the knowledge of how to export it, download it, import it back into another instance, you know, do all that rigmarole, not my favorite. If you're comparable with ETL and you have SSIS packages, you have Azure Data Factory, you've got some sort of ETL that can extract the data and the schema out of the database and put it somewhere. Another option that I am not a fan of, but it is a valid option. You can do this. Um, and I have seen organizations that do have SSIS packages that do that very thing. That is their DR solution. Um, it requires somebody to have that knowledge of how to build that process and then also maintain it. I don't, that's one of the things I don't like is a disaster recovery solution that I am dependent on somebody else to have knowledge on. Um, especially if I'm responsible to make sure that the environment can get back online. So I'm not a fan of using ETL. We can, so I, I mentioned copy only backups. This doesn't work with Azure SQL database, but you can take copy only backups of Azure SQL managed instance databases. So you can do a copy only backup, put it to blob storage, and then restore that somewhere on another managed instance. Again, it's a manual process. You could script it, you could automate it to some degree, um, but that might require that you've got a managed instance sitting around just running because you can't pause a managed instance and managed instances are not necessarily cheap. So again, not one of my favorite options uh, and it's starred because it only works with managed instance. The other thing I've seen lately is dev opsing everything. If you have a database that you can rebuild most of the data um, or whatnot, I've seen some organizations that use their DevOps workflow to you and basically redeploy the database with a static data and they, they run processes to kind of rebuild the data. Uh, normally this is like in a re reporting type of format where they can, you know, they're extracting data out of one data source and you know, transforming it and then loading it into a data mart or a, a data warehouse of some sort. Um, but that's a production environment. But they they use their DevOps workflow to to actually facilitate that. Uh, and that, that is a valid solution. Um, it's not one that I like just because I'm not. I can do DevOps, but it's just not my forte. So I prefer to have solutions that I can click a button and and make things happen. So let's talk about restoring from backup. One of the things I love about platforms of service, especially as a DBA, backups happen automatically. I have several clients where I am their DBA. They do not have anybody on staff that is knowledgeable enough in SQL Server to provide production level support. So they hire us, they hire Denny Chair and Associates to provide that resource. Uh, I've got a client. They are 100% in Azure. They are using Azure SQL Database as their data store. 
their admin team sometimes will create new databases for whatever project that they are on. Thankfully, with Service Fabric of Azure will automatically take backups for me. I don't have to worry about, well, did, you know, am I excluding that database from Ola's job? Do I need to adjust anything? Um, I don't have to worry about it because the Service Fabric does it for me and I can't, I can't even change it. Like I have no control over how or when those backups happen. Now the backups happen uh, on a frequency. Um, you'd get a weekly full, you get a uh, two differential backups twice a day. I'm sorry, you get a differential backup twice a day. Uh, and you can control that. Um, and you get transaction log backups about every four to six minutes, depending on how busy that logical server is and what's going on with your workloads. But about four to four to six, four to seven minutes, you get a transaction log backup. The differential backup you can change. They actually introduced uh, relatively new within the last couple of months, six months, I think, the ability to say, hey, I don't need I don't need a differential backup every 12 hours. I want to take it once a day um, because you, you pay for that storage. The other beauty that I really like is that right out of the gate, by default, you get seven days of point in time restore capability for uh, Azure SQL Database and managed instance. You can extend that up to 35 days. Uh, my client actually, they have said there's a policy that says, hey, we will never restore to a point in time beyond that 35 days. If you have a need to do that, you can specify a long-term retention for full backups up to 10 years. And you can, you can specify that retention based off a weekly full, monthly full, annual full. So if I had an auditing requirement that says, um, and, and I think a lot of organizations will do this, hey, I need to keep the last full backup of the year. So on December 31st at midnight, I'm sorry, 11.59 PM, I need to take a full backup and I need to retain that for auditing purposes you can actually configure that within the portal to say, take that last backup and we're going to keep that in long term retention for up to 10 years. That's additional cost, but if you have auditing requirements to do that, then you can specify that in the portal. Uh, and we, we by default, the backup for that is, I'm sorry, the redundancy for that backup actually uses geo redundant storage. So when we do the backups, they also just introduced this. You can actually change that to locally redundant storage to save on cost. But the default is geo redundant, meaning we take the backup of the database. That backup is actually automatically replicated to a completely different storage account behind the scenes uh, in a different region. It's the paired region for wherever your database is sitting. But by default, Microsoft and Azure already says, hey, DR is important. We're going to replicate that backup somewhere else just in case something goes sideways. Again, that was the default. And for a long time, you couldn't change that. And then they introduced the ability to say, now nah, this is a dev database. I don't care. I don't need that geo redundant storage. I'm going to make it locally redundant. So it's locally redundant within that region. But by default, it's geo redundant. Makes me give me warm and fuzzies as a database professional. I don't have to worry about it. It's already there. And you need to restore from backups. So the, the service gives us a bunch of flexibility with the backups. Yeah, we can't control it, but I like that. I like that. When we restore, we have to restore into the same subscription as the source. So if I, and this is kind of painful, and it's ash, this, there's, an, there's a star and asterisk there, there is a workaround. But by default, if you go into the portal and say, hey, I want to restore this database to a different server and a different subscription, the portal is pretty much going to say, no way, we're not going to do it. What you can do, though, is if you restore to a server within the same subscription, there is a product or a tool called Azure Resource Mover. So you can restore that database down, use Azure Resource Mover, and technically move that restored copy to a different subscription. So there is a workaround. It just, you gotta do a couple of different hops to, to, to kind of um, make that happen. If we 
you're doing a point in time restore, you have to restore to the same logical server where that source came from. So we have to restore back to that same server. And if you're doing a point in time restore, obviously we're probably doing that for a reason. For a reason. Um, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is, and I don't remember if I have a slide about this or not, you can't restore over top of the existing database. So that's that's one thing that's a little bit different. If you're used to being an on-premises DBA and you do a restore and you specify with replace, that will overwrite the physical files of the database that's sitting on that physical hard drive. With Azure, it, it doesn't work that way. So it's a protection mechanism to say, hey, you have to restore the database to a new name or blow away, delete the old one, and then restore. I don't like deleting the old one. Um, I'm that DBA that likes to ensure that I can actually like roll back things if I need to, even, even a damaged database or there's something going on. And so I will typically either rename the existing database and then do a restore or restore to a brand new one, rename the old one and rename the new one, right? Do you just have to do that, that, that logical naming switch of the database? It's a different step. You know, it's an additional step that we're not kind of used to, but it is there to kind of protect you to make sure you don't overwrite the wrong one. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind is that if you do a restore, you have to, and the, and the portal will tell you. It'll tell you that you can't, you can't restore over top the existing thing. If we have long-term retention backups, we can actually, um, we can re we can restore that long-term retention backups across regions. Um, and that's not a problem. So if you have that long-term retention set up, we can restore that across uh, regions. If you have a large database, unfortunately, this kind of sucks. It can take time because it depends on where the the storage, where the backups are sitting, how busy that that you know the compute node is underneath the hood. Backups can take time, and there's no real good visibility into how long that's going to take. If you're used to going into the, the, the dynamic management views and looking at the um, estimated time of the percent complete, unfortunately, if you're doing it in Azure, you get three choices, 0%, 50%, 100%, and it's not very accurate. I've seen databases that were relatively small in size take 45 minutes to restore. Um, so if you are in Azure, I highly this is why I highly recommend do a restore and see how long it takes because you might be surprised where that restore of your database might take hours and that is going to affect your RPO and your RTO. It depends on what it's going on. So, uh, and that's why I recommend you test that. Uh, oh, we got a question. I have a prod in U18. This is yeah, so the question is, I have a production and UAT server in the same subscription. Is it then possible to restore prod DB to the UAT server easily? And that is yes. You should be able to easily, as long as it's within the same subscription, you should be, be able to go into the portal, select your database, and then it'll say, what server do you want to restore to? And you can select that server, as long as it's in the same subscription. The trick is, and my client actually, we actually ran into this, my client used to have all of their SQL servers in the same subscription, and we would actually do that process where we would restore production down, and that restoring production data down to a non-production environment has a, is a whole other conversation. But they separated out the non-production into a different subscription for billing purposes, and that broke that process because now I can't go from one subscription to the other. Uh, and that was an interesting thing to run into. We had actually had to change things. So uh, managed instance, we can't restore the entire instance. So while the backups are all being taken automatically for us, we can't actually go in and say, hey, restore this whole thing all at once, boom. So if you have a bunch of databases on a managed instance, you have to manage those individually, unfortunately. Um, we can, of course, restore a copy-only backup, as I mentioned previously, from managed instance. I can take that copy-only backup. I can also uh, take a backup of my local on-premises database and then restore it to managed instances. 
Um, and yeah, I did mention that we can't overwrite any existing database in either platform, so it doesn't matter. Another thing that is really important, and I say this, uh, if we don't, as data professionals, if we don't know some level of command line coding, as you look at managed instance, and as well as other things within Azure, the Azure ecosystem, you'll notice here on the slide, there are a number of ways to, um, you know, like restore the database down. You can use the portal, you can use Azure CLI, but you'll notice that PowerShell, you can do all four options in PowerShell. Moving to Azure really needs to, we, we as data professionals really need to learn PowerShell to facilitate proper disaster recovery, make sure that we can do things right. So the moral of the story that I just want to throw out there is to learn PowerShell. Um, there are other things in Azure that you can't do through the portal and you have to use PowerShell. Okay, so that's restore, backup and restore. Any questions about that? I don't see any questions. We're going to keep going. Okay, active geo replication. So active geo replication is for Azure SQL database only. You can't do this with Azure SQL managed instance. So you can basically replicate data either to the same region or a different region that will provide a readable secondary of that database. So, and I really equate this to like availability groups behind the scenes. And technically it, it basically uses availability groups behind the scene. You can have up to four, four secondaries, but you can actually daisy chain those replicas. So you could actually have your production database, have a geo replicated um, database, and then actually geo replicate that one and, and so forth. So just keep in mind though, that there's latency you know, the more chains you have, the, the the slower it's going to be because it's, you know, all that data has to transmit all the way down. So you can get four secondaries and you can daisy chain them. One of the beauties about active geo replication versus auto failover groups is that you can provide a readable secondary in that same region. Failover groups, you can't do that. So if I had, if I wanted to provide a read only workload source, and all my users for my application are sitting on the Eastern seaboard of the United States, I can put a readable secondary copy of the database in that same region. So I'm keeping the, the readable copy as close to my end users as possible because I can't beat the speed of light. And so I want those two to be as close as possible for latency purposes. Active geo replication allows that. Um, The other thing about active geo replication is you can do automatic failover, but it has to be initiated by either A, a person, meaning your DBA, or B, the application has to be smart enough to know that there's an issue and then initiate that failover. The Azure service fabric is not going to automatically fail over your database if there's an issue. So you can, it is automatic, but Again, an end user has to do something to initiate it or the application does. So your application has to be coded for that specifically to, hey, my connection timeouts are 30,000 and climbing, we're going to initiate that failover. And then the application has to have the right permissions to actually initiate that. One of the beauties about active geo replication, it's super quick to, to set up. Um, we actually had a client several years ago um, they were on the eastern seaboard and a hurricane was coming up the eastern seaboard and they were in the east us either the east us or east us2 i don't remember which but they had not stood up active geo replication or failover groups or whatnot and so we actually were able to at least start the process for them to get the active geo replication stood up in a different region so that their data would get replicated fully as as as, quick, know, as quickly as possible before the hurricane showed up just to make sure um, and then once the hurricane passed if they didn't want it we could delete the the secondaries um, and as i mentioned it provides uh, availability group technology behind the scenes so if you're familiar with uh, availability groups and how that functions uh, it's pretty much the exact same technology underneath the hood 
Uh, and by, by sheer nature, just because we can put things in a different region, um, because of that, you know, that distance, that 100 mile distance, um, it's asynchronous in nature. If we do a failover, the failover would actually flip to synchronous and allow for things to kind of catch up before it failed over. Um, so there are mechanisms in place to kind of facilitate that. At a high level, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, we can see here that we've got geo replication. We've got two two nodes. There's a, on the left is the primary logical server. On the right is the secondary. Uh, in between the two, we've got geo replication. Um, there is a in this diagram. There is a load balancer in between. Uh, and we can. The other thing is that, and I'll mention a little bit later. If we do a failover with uh, geo replication. We also have to change connection strings for our application. There is no endpoint that will do a DNS change or anything like that. So there's additional work if we use failover groups for a true DR scenario. Auto failover groups. So uh, geo replication is defined at the database. Auto failover groups is defined at the server. Uh, one of the things that auto failover groups really is really good at is we actually get a read write endpoint. This is basically a, uh, if you're familiar with networking, this is basically like a C name in DNS. And when we fail over, that endpoint will just do a DNS switch behind the scenes. Um, and we don't have to change anything with our application. There are regional limits for auto failover groups. Um, and it comes with a one hour minimum grace period. Now, this grace period is really about because auto failover groups, as I mentioned with geo replication, the service fabric won't initiate that failover. With auto failover groups, the service fabric will. So the Azure service fabric will say, Oop, we have an outage in this region. You have a failover group. We're going to automatically fail you over to wherever your secondary region is. But Azure doesn't know what your workload is like. And so that grace period is there to say, hey, it's in the middle of the night. You've got a workload. We're going to give your workload one hour to actually get all your transactions into a synchronous commit status. So we have one hour to allow everything that's in flight to actually hit the secondary. And then after that one hour, we're going to fail over. That one hour is configurable. If you have a very busy uh, transactional load, you can go all the way up to 24 hours, I believe, uh, but no more. You can't go beyond a day. Uh, I've never seen anybody that has changed that grace period. Almost everybody wants to be able to fail over pretty quickly. If that one hour grace period isn't enough, then somebody, an end user, you know, a DBA, a manager, somebody who has permissions can go into that failover group and click a button that says failover. If you click that failover button, it's going to fail over. Uh, and, and that one hour is really designed to minimize the, any service interruption, um, but the service fabric will do that for you. And failover groups is really built on top of geo replication. If we look at this diagram, we'll see it's pretty comparable to uh, geo replication. So the failover group really is, and I'll show you in the demo when we get to the portal, the failover group really is almost like a DNS entry that sits on top of that. So it's like a listener, an, an act, uh, availability group listener that sits on top of that geo replication, but it does provide us that read write endpoint and a read only endpoint, which is really super handy. And this is kind of what the endpoints look like. So in this case, I have a database stood up in East US2. My secondary uh, is in North Central. The, the endpoints here, so you can point your applications to those endpoints, and then if a failover happens, you don't have to change anything with the application. If you have a read-only workload, you can point it to that read-only listener endpoint, and it'll always be rep routed to the read-only copy of your database. My client actually utilizes these endpoints. Uh, they are in South Central and North Central, and we fail things back and forth, and things are just hunky-dory. Now. One thing to note about that failover, if you've done a failover in availability groups, it's pretty much the same process. There is a downtime for that while it fails over. So your application has to be transient error capable because that connection is going to drop. 
So it has to have a retry logic built into it to say, okay, five seconds later, I'm going to try that connection again, and hopefully it'll fail over in that time and we can be back online. If your application is sensitive to those transient errors, that might not be a good solution for you. Um, unfortunately, that's just, there's no other way around that. We have to break all those connections in order to fail over. So that's going to happen. Um, so here, uh, this is this just um, indicates the differences between the geo replication auto failover groups. So geo replication doesn't provide me automatic failover unless I'm automatic and I go and I push the button, or my application does. Um, failover groups, I have, I don't have to change my connection string for my applications, which is really handy. I can do failover groups for managed instances. I can't do geo replication for managed instances. But geo-replication, I can put in the same region. I can have multiple replicas, and I support both will support read scale. So there are pros and cons to both. I love, love failover groups because it makes my life as a DBA super, I'm not going to say super easy, but it's easier. And because I'm lazy, I like things that, you know, let me you know do what I like to do, and I don't have to worry about it. So managed instance. Failover group, a little bit different architecture because managed instance is a completely different beast behind the scenes from Azure SQL database. If you recall, managed instance is that that answer between on-premises and then you know there's Azure SQL database up top where we don't have access to a number of things within SQL Server. Managed instance is that that answer from Microsoft to kind of sit in the middle, but it is built on different architecture behind the scenes. Failover group within different subscriptions as long as it's within the same tenant. Um, the other thing with managed instance failover group is you configure and remember just like the failover group for Azure SQL Database, um, it's configured at the server level. So once we configure that failover group between the two managed instances, every single database on that man on the primary will be synchronized with the secondary. So there is no having to put a single database into an availability group, right? You know, if you if you have an availability group on premises, you can kind of pick and choose what database goes into what availability group or whatnot. You can't do that with managed instance. So as soon as you create a database on a managed instance that's involved with a failover group, the Azure world will automatically pick it up and start to replicate it to that secondary, wherever that might be. We still get the benefit of that readable secondary endpoint. If we want, so if we want to direct our read only workloads to that secondary, we can do that and uh, we still get the grace period. This in this, the failover groups for managed instance, you'll, this looks just like what it does for Azure SQL database. But one of the things that are different is you'll notice that there's a DNS zone. Setting up, setting up failover groups and geo replication for Azure SQL database is three clicks of a mouse and you're done. You're done configuring it anyways, and it'll do its thing and things will start to happen. Failover groups with managed instance is more complicated because of the architecture behind the scenes and the way that the network has to function to allow that synchronization to happen. Like it has to be within the same DNS zone. And so it's a little bit more complicated and we have to understand some networking terminology because and I think I mentioned this later in a slide. Um, it can't overlap IP spaces, right? And so we have to do things a little bit different. The other thing, it takes time to, to create. I have a demo of a failover group for managed instances here. It took me 12 hours to, to put together because I had to create the first, my primary managed instance. And then I had to create the secondary managed instance and put a failover group between the two. Both of the managed instances took about six hours to create. The second one actually took about four and a half to five. So it's not a simple process to just click a button and, you know, lo and behold, you're going to get this brand new secondary managed instance and everything will be magically delicious. So it is definitely more complex to configure. The other thing that is from a networking perspective, you have to have because they are in different regions and potentially in different subscriptions, they are also going to be potentially in different VNets. Uh, actually, I'm pretty sure they're going to be in different VNets. 
we have to have some way to make them talk to each other. And previously when they released it, it was, you had to have a VPN gateway to make this all work. They relatively recently, within the past, uh, past six months, I think, they enabled the, the global VNet pairing. So I can, and that's the way that my demo is set up. I've actually got my two VNets peered together so that the two managed instances can talk to each other. Uh, another gotcha is you can't remove that secondary without destroying the failover group. With Azure SQL Database, I can move things in and out of that failover group and not destroy that failover group because the failover group really at that on that product is really just a DNS entry. I can move things in and out and I can leave that failover group there and it won't hurt anything. Um, I ran into this. Instances must be the same size. So you can't, so somebody might have an availability group with on-premises where their DR node is a smaller size of a VM, either for capacity reasons or cost reason, regions, or reasons, knowing that if you failed over, you would just scale that up. Unfortunately, with managed instance, they have to be identical. Scaling managed instances can take time. Ask me how I know because scaling your compute for managed instances also takes four or five hours. Um, so there, there are additional things that we have to think about when we stand up disaster recovery for managed instances. Um, they must be in the same DNS zone. Uh, Microsoft recommends using paired regions for performance because the paired regions between, in like East US and West US are the paired regions. There are additional enhancements for the the networking the the compute all of that between the paired regions so that's why microsoft for performance says hey just use the paired regions if you can um, you'll get better performance overall and i mentioned it before the ip space can't overlap ask me how i know because i originally created the demo and i selected the wrong ip space for the secondary but you don't find that out until it is done building. So five hours later, that secondary managed instance came online. I couldn't get it into a failover group. And then I had to delete that managed instance. And guess what? Deleting a managed instance also takes four or five, six hours to do. And then I had to recreate it. So I spent like 18 hours refixing that IP space problem. So this is where one having a little bit of knowledge of the networking behind the scenes and doing some planning before you do disaster recovery for managed instance really comes in handy because it takes time to create these so and i think and i didn't ask how long do i have benny hour can i go over an hour uh yeah yeah definitely i mean okay. we, we slotted in 75 minutes um the hard close is at 8 p.m for us which means that it's that's three. Yeah, three for you. That's the hard close. Yeah. I should be done by then. Yeah, I've been known okay. to talk for a while, so. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. So you all should see. Yeah, we'll toggle that. Increase the zoom. Can everybody see the portal? Yeah, that's the portal. That's cool. Good. All right. So this is my uh, this is my tenant. I have some Azure SQL database as well as a, a couple managed instances. Um, we're going to play around primarily with the AdventureWorks 2017 for Azure SQL database. Uh, we can see here that it is online. It is general purpose, uh, and I do have to apologize that my camera is right ahead of me, but the screen I have to look at is over here. So I'm not ignoring you if I look over here. Um, it's general purpose. It's just got one core, and I just use this as demo purposes. If we are in the blade and we are looking at the database, we can see that my server is SQL DB demo 2. Um, I am in the East US 2. We can look at a couple different things. Uh, we can restore it. So we can actually come up here and click restore if we wanted to. We can actually export it. This is the export process that I was talking about. I can export it to a storage account and then go download it, download that backpack from the storage account. Not my preferred method for disaster recovery. Uh, if I want to look at backups and long-term retention, that is configured at the server. We can go into this blade over here and look on the left, we'll see backups. We can actually drive into that backup blade. We've got my databases that are listed on that server. 
we can see that my earliest point in time recovery is 316.22. Um, I don't have long-term retention backup configured, but I can click on retention policies and we can see right off the bat, here's my database. I've got that seven day default point in time recovery. I'm doing a differential backup every 12 hours. I don't have any weekly or monthly long-term retention set up, but we can configure that. And this is how easy it is, right? If you remember, you know, if you're familiar with on-premises work being a DBA and we had to always adjust OLAS scripts or we had some sort of script that we had to manage or a log or a agent job we had to manage and ensure that it ran and all that, um, we can change the differential backup to every from 12 hours to 24. We can specify, hey, I want to keep weekly backups. So every full backup every week for X number of weeks, months, years, same thing with a monthly backup or the yearly backup. Um, and when, this, you know, when I talked about that annual backup on December 31st, I can specify what I want to keep the annual backup for 10 years and I'm going to specify week 52. So if I click apply, then I, the backups, the weekly backups that are taken for the AdventureWorks 2017 database would then be kept for 10 years um, once I hit week 52. In my case, I because I don't want to waste the credits, I don't need that. But it's, it's just really indicative of how easy it is to configure a disaster recovery solution, if that fits your needs, just for the couple clicks in the portal. Uh, so that's backup retention and restore. Um, if I wanted to restore it, I could. So let's go look at geo-replication. And geo-replication is at the database level. So if you go into the database, and we go over here on the blade on the left, we'll actually see in, you'll be surprised at how often Microsoft actually changes the portal. They've changed this, how what this looks like like three or four times now. It used to say geo replication, then it would say replica, and then it said something else, and it came back to replica. But if we click on replicas, we can see that I don't have any replicas stood up. So this is geo replication. If I wanted to create one, I could just click create. I'm going to select, I have, a, I have another logical server. SQL DB demo two, and that server is actually located in the West US, so all the way across the United States. It's already defaulted my subscription, my resource group that I'm sitting in, uh, the database name, you can't change, all that stuff. If you wanted to create a new server, you could. Um, if you wanted to use an elastic pool, you could all specify that. Um, here we can specify our backup retention because it's the database on the secondary, because it's readable, you can take a backup of. Um, and so we can actually, uh, if we want it from the source, uh, I don't care about GeoRedundant redundant backup, so all good. That's gonna cost me 90, 90, 90 cents a month. So how many mouse clicks did that take? It was only a handful. If we watch, the build, let me go back out to, if I can find it. SQL databases, AdventureWorks. So here we can see that one, my blade has changed. I now have a some, some data in here. We can see that I've got a geo replica being stood up and it's currently seeding. Right, and so again, if you're familiar with the availability works or availability group terminology, right now the service, the Azure, is taking a backup and moving it to the West US and restoring it and seeding it and putting it into that availability group. So, and the database is pretty small. I think it's 500 megs in size. It's not that very big, but if all goes well, this will come online and then automatically I'll have a readable secondary database in a completely different region all the way across the United States for a disaster recovery solution if I had to. Um, I can connect to it, I can read it, I can make changes to it and everything will be magically delicious and, and show up. So if I refresh this, it might take a few minutes because it's actually sending that data all the way across the United States. 
And because, ah, came online. So you can see that one, it was pretty quick. You know, what, five minutes, give or take-ish? Maybe give or take a minute or two? So that's one of the things I love about the 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 cloud technology is, does anybody remember, this is where I would ask for a show of hands, but, and I'm, I started my IT career in 1996. I distinctly remember setting up DR technology where it was a six month process. You had to go rent space somewhere else. You had to get physical hardware somewhere else. You had to figure out a way to get connectivity to that space. And by the time you did that, all the hardware you purchased for that purpose is out of date because the technology would roll over every six months. Whereas now we can do a disaster recovery solution for our production environments very, very quickly. Now, if I wanted a failover group, I can actually delete this. So if I actually say stop. Yes, I'm gonna stop the replication. I'm actually gonna to go to that server. I'm gonna delete that database so I can put a failover group in place. So right now, Azure is breaking that replication. That database in West will actually stay online. So I actually have to, if I refresh this, this will go away. We can see that I've got it here. So I actually have to delete this. And because you have to type in, they always say don't type in a demo, but I'm gonna type in it anyways. We'll see if it, it will get deleted. So if we talk about failover groups, and remember, geo replications is a database, failover groups is at the server, and we got, and so that database got deleted. Oh, here's a tidbit. SQL, Azure SQL database logical servers have to be unique. I now have empire.database.windows.net. It is, if you have no databases on it, it's free. But nobody else can take that uh, server name. So Azure SQL database logical names is the new domain squatting if you want a server with that name. Tidbit of information. You can start selling those names know, as well right? in the future. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, and that was, I did a whole, uh, I did a presentation where it was all Star Wars themes. Like I was dressed like a Jedi and all that. And so I went through and, and like just started getting Star Wars related names for servers. And there's no databases on them. They just, they just sit out there. I figured Empire was, was a good one. And like, cause there's Naboo, there's Rebel Alliance. Um, failover groups is at the server. So if I create a new group, I'm going to create this as demo on DB. And let's see if that is. Uh, this is sometimes, when, especially when you do a demo, you have to figure out some unique name. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's the secondary name. So I'm specifying that DB demo two in my West is going to be my failover, is going to be my secondary. Uh, I can change my automatic failover policy. If I don't want Azure to actually fail that over, I can. And this is where I can change my grace period. Remember that was that grace period that the, the, yeah, go up to 24 hours. I'm not going to change any of that. I'm going to select what databases I want. I want my AdventureWorks 2017. And so that was what? One, two, three, four. Let's say two clicks of the mouse, five, three clicks and create. So right now what Azure is doing is standing up another availability group. It's gonna put the AdventureWorks 2017 into that availability group. It's also going to create a DNS entry for the failover group name that I gave it. And so now there's gonna be that demo one DB test dot um, database dot windows dot net. And then there's gonna be a secondary dot windows dot net. And so if we wait for a few minutes, this is online. We can actually see, and this is one of the things I like about the failover group is we do get this handy little nice geographical, hey, where's things replicating? I don't personally like that the primary is in green. Um, actually, they just changed that. 
that actually used to be reversed. The green used to be the secondary and the primary was blue. Um, and I never actually liked the primary as blue. Um, oh, we can't see that because I have this turned on. Let's turn this off. So now we see we have our read, write, listener endpoints. So my application can then use that to connect to and it'll be routed effectively. And then once it comes online, this line will turn solid. And so we can do things with it. Um, so five clicks, I have a fully functional DR solution for my Azure SQL database. I love that. I think that's a fantastic end user experience to provide a disaster recovery scenario. Um, do you pay for that secondary? Yeah, you pay for that secondary, but I can easily fail things over. Uh, once it comes online, we can take a look at it if that comes back. However, while we wait on that, we can go look at managed instances. <clears throat> Any questions? Nope. Cool. Well, we'll come back to the failover group. So here I've got two managed instances. The names are pretty self-explanatory. One is in the East US, the other one's in the West US. Um, as I said, I had just created these yesterday. There is one database on it. I put a demo one database on it. Uh, it is online. I do have a failover group already stood up, as I mentioned, just because of the sheer duration it takes to create these, I had to pre-allocate pre this. Uh, we do get the same read, write, listener endpoints. One of the downsides about the failover groups is, uh, let me back up. With the failover group with Azure SQL Database, you can make that uh, publicly accessible, right? So you can actually give it, to, like I could give it to Benny, Benny can go hit it if you if you wanted to. If a failover group, you have a failover group with managed instance, there's no way to actually get that on the public side. That has to stay, you have to have a VPN connection, you have to uh, have some way to get into the VNet where the managed instances live. And I think that's because of the DNS zone and the way that the networking architecture is behind the scenes. I haven't been able to find a way to actually facilitate that. I've got an email into Microsoft um, to see if I was doing something wrong, but I haven't heard back yet. Uh, and I mentioned the DNS zone, and that's actually what this is this unique um, address. Um, and so we can actually hit that from like my house right now. I can actually log into, I'm actually logged into my East and West MIs. And so there's actually a public endpoint. So I can actually open that up to the each individual instance. I can't hit that failover group endpoint from my house because um, I don't have a VPN connection to that environment. I'm just doing it through the portal. But we can see that right now I'm logged into my East US MI. If I change this a little bit, I can run queries, I can do things with it. So we know that it's it's up and active. I just can't hit this um, from, from my house, unfortunately. I can't hit this endpoint, uh, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. Um, and it's currently in a synchronizing stat status. So if I were to create a new database, it would automatically be synchronized and move over. If I wanted to fail over, ta-da, and we will actually see that this is going to flip. And so they changed this too, because that used to be blue, and now it's green and this one's white. So right now the availability group, and it basically it's like a distributed availability group, it is failing over. And so this will actually flip once that failover is done. And the primary will be West MI and the secondary will be East, if all goes well. Ta-da, right? And again, a single mouse click, I just initiated a DR solution for my entire managed instance and all the databases on it. Because remember, the failover group encompasses all the databases, not just one or two. Um, and so easy, once you have it set up, easy to facilitate a failover, um, which I love. Again, it's very, very easy. So real quick, let's go back to our adventure works. Actually, let's do this. Dun, 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 dun. And make sure our failover group. Ah, line is solid. That means the seeding has been done. I can actually do a failover. Yes. Again, a failover, easy peasy. Click the button. We give it a few minutes. We'll see that these roles will switch. 
Um, you can do a forced failover. So if there was an instance where uh, you needed to fail over right then, you know, right then and there, quick force failover. The trick with forced failover is just like an availability group. If you force that failover, you do run the risk of potential data loss. So just know that if you click that forced failover, you could lose whatever data is in flight. SQL Server is going to kill it, and that transaction's done. And we can see that that flipped over, right? So now my West is primary, my East US2 is my secondary. And so that's all the way across the United States. Uh, I think that's pretty cool, personally. Um, I love this technology. Um, when would you have to do such a failover in a real life scenario? Obviously we're doing it now for demos, but when would you do that in a real life scenario? So great question. Um, if, if you had a backhoe event where somebody took out a data center, uh, you might have to do that failover. Um, a failover could also be a good example is we actually, my client that is 100% Azure SQL database, Microsoft will occasionally do maintenance on your database behind the scenes. And remember that the cloud is somebody's hardware. And so there's data centers with racks and racks of virtual machine hosts running Hyper-V. And so there's physical hardware somewhere. And so they have to facilitate maintenance on those, those physical pieces of equipment. We actually ran into a problem where Microsoft moved my client's production uh, databases onto a bad storage node. And the latency for their database calls was in the range of like multiple seconds for every call. Normally you're going to get latency of like two milliseconds, three milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, really, really fast storage for the most part. But they, we landed on a bad node. We didn't, Microsoft didn't know it's all automated. We didn't know either. We could have initiated a failover to get out of that bad storage. And so that was one option. We actually opted to, in my case, that my client actually utilizes elastic pools. And so we actually scaled the elastic pool, which also facilitated moving off of that storage. And so we actually got out of that bad storage using the elastic pool. But if your application can facilitate the one using the endpoints and two, the 60 second downtime that may be there. Usually it's faster than that. Um, failing over to get out of that bad hardware or that bad situation is a very viable solution. Uh, in that case, that was if the, if the scaling didn't work for my client, failover was the next option. Um, thankfully, we had all this configured beforehand that we could just do that failover. Uh, it does happen. Data centers do go down. Um, if you don't use availability zones, uh, which is multiple multiple data centers within that region um they, they it happens um it just does um, cords get cut things go down weather happens mother nature happens um so having things in place is is important good question though all right thank you so that's the demo do you, anything else you you all want to see i think i showed you pretty much everything that i can think of Easy, easy peasy to set up other than the managed instance, but the duration. And went a little bit over, but I'm almost done, I promise. With any type of DR, please, 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 please test it. You don't want to be in the middle of a DR situation and not know where to go, where, where in the portal to go, what scripts to run, how long is it gonna take, do all of that. Um, thankfully, like I'm going to use my client again. We actually have a DR scenario set up in our Q, in their QAT environment, just as they do in production. And we actually do pretty routine failover events in their non-production environment to see how things behave, making sure that new application code can handle that transient error and all that. Um, so please, please, please test. So quick summary, several restore options are available. Um, Impossible. So there's different ways that you can do disaster recovery with Azure SQL Database or managed instance. You can use geo-replication for SQL Database. You can do failover groups for both offerings, depending on what your needs are. I personally think failover groups offer the highest level of automation in DBA laziness, because that's what's important to me. Um, and always, please make sure you test and verify regularly. So with that, any other questions?